Welcome to the first ever inter-school budget debate challenge organised by the Ministry of Finance. Students from 16 secondary schools and 16 junior colleges are participating and assuming roles from the perspective of business interest groups, environmentalists, high income earners and even the ministry. There are a multitude of job opportunities available in Singapore. There is no such thing as a good tax. Through this competition, MOF hopes to promote greater student awareness of the budget and public financing issues through mock parliamentary budget debates. 16 speakers, all convincing in their own right. Who's the best? Judge for yourself. If you haven't caught any of the episodes on Razor TV, grab this chance to do so. Watch the Finance Ministry's Inter-School Budget Debate Challenge on Razor TV and take part in our Viewer's Choice Contest and you could win $150 worth of shopping vouchers. Vote whom you think is the best speaker out of the 16 and in 20 words or less, tell us why. Do remember to register as a Stomp user and log in to vote. Your vote will determine Razor TV's Viewer's Choice Award of Best Speaker for the Secondary School category and the pre u School category. Voting comes to a close today at 4pm, so vote now if you can. The debate is in partnership with Razor TV and the Debate Association. And to reach the pertinent masses, what better way to do it than through Razor TV's target audience of the 18 to 40 group? And what is Razor TV about? The Straits Times Razor TV is an online television service that broadcasts live from our multimedia centre web studio and it offers video on demand for those who want to control what they want to watch and when. Razor TV delivers news and lifestyle content that is relevant and informal. Finance Minister Thaman Shamugaratnam has announced a $20.5 billion resilience package to fight the economic downturn. However, he said the package is not a magic pill. Rage, which tells you what's all the rage in Singapore, is up next. I'm going to be going to Salsa Ringi at Dance Hub to try some Bollywood dancing. Left, up. Point blank, the current affairs show that gets you up close and personal with the newsmakers and the people they affect. But the residents are concerned about four houses in the private estate which houses hordes of foreign workers. One of the workers invited us into the house when we asked about their living conditions. As we entered the house, we were approached by the caretaker who demanded to know what we were doing. Oh, we just want to come in and see your house environment. Joining us tonight are some of the most articulate students in Singapore. They are the debaters from the Ministry of Finance Budget Debate Challenge. Earlier, we had a little budget party and now we are going to talk about serious stuff. What's your general impression of it? It was very comprehensive, very detailed <laughs> and uh, had a wealth of measures that were essential to uh, preserving the Singapore integrity of the Singapore economy as well as the welfare of its people. And how about Razor Pop, the entertainment program that gives you the lowdown on Asian and local music movies and more. It's Razor Pop La! Here is what Red Cliff 2 is about. Red Cliff 2 is a John Woo film. It's supposed to be one movie and then it got so long, he made it into two. Which means you guys are paying twice, twice. I gave this three and a half coffees out of five. News and views are raw, edgy and coupled with real life interactivity, unlike traditional TV broadcasts. We're always mm. open to your suggestions and your comments and your opinions. We like that on the bonus stage. You know, mm. I may be wrong, you know, but most likely I'm not wrong. <laughs> Bring it home the news. It's all about staying on top. Welcome back, and we are live at Raffles Institution for the first ever MOF Inter-School Debates. We are just about to get started on the much-anticipated pre-university debate finals. And I have eight not very nervous-looking individuals. They all look pretty calm, and they are looking like... Okay, one's looking quite fierce. Okay, so... <laughs> Sorry, I meant you, but yeah. <laughs> what, you're from Hua Chong, is it? Ah, okay. Very fierce. Good. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure all of you are looking forward to hearing what they have to say. And we will hand over the time to Hui Hui, who is the chair for the pre-university debates. So, ladies and gentlemen, you have your time. Thank you, Sarah. And a very good afternoon again, minister, guests, 
judges, ladies and gentlemen, let's move on to the pre-university division of the MOF Inter-School Budget Debate Finals. The topic for this final is, This House Will Not Bail Out Banks If They Fail. Today, we have eight debaters from four schools participating in our finals. I'd like to request that the audience hold their applause until we've introduced the speakers on each side. In Proposition Team 1, on my right, we have Anglo-Chinese School Independent, represented by Lloyd So and David Croshaw. In Proposition Team 2, further on my right, we have Innova Junior College, represented by Kenny Ngo and Jesslyn Wong. A round of applause for the Proposition side. In Opposition Team 1, we have Hua Chong Institution, represented by Ng Lui Chun and Jamie Pang. In Opposition Team 2, we have Victoria Junior College, represented by Sarah Yip and Deborah Ho. A round of applause for the speakers, please. The format and rules for this debate are the same as those in the previous debate, so let's begin the debate now. To start us out, I call Lloyd So of Anglo-Chinese School Independent to open the case for Proposition Team 1. We know that we are in a global financial crisis right now, but thankfully, none of our local banks are facing failure yet. This gives us the benefit of foresight to take preventive measures now to ensure that our banks do not end up like another Bear Stearns or another Lehman Brothers. Let's define a few terms. First, a bank is a financial institution which, measure, which manages savings, loans, and investments. And local banks include DBS, OCBC, and UOB. A bank is deemed to have failed when it finds that its liabilities exceed its assets and it files for insolvency. A bill occurs when the government injects money to support a failed bank. But the Ministry of Finance is neither obligated nor willing to bail out banks. Let me instead advocate an alternative policy. Number one, creating a lower risk environment for banking. This is through tight MAS regulations, which are already in place, as well as the government guaranteeing loans to the banks through the Special Risk Sharing Initiative, New Bridging Loan Program, and the Local Enterprise Firm Scheme, uh, Local Enterprise uh, Finance Scheme, announced last Thursday in the budget speech. Number two, protecting the customer's savings through the deposit insurance scheme. And number three, on top of existing measures, the facilitation of selling banks, failed banks, to its viable investors. This is much like how Barclays and Nomura Holdings bought over Lehman Brothers. Our stance is governed by two key principles. Number one, the ministry and the government's duty to our citizens. And number two, our duty to the economy. I'll be elaborating the first principle, whereas my deputy here, David, is going to be elaborating the second principle. The government has a responsibility over the people, as the people are the ones who have voted this cabinet in and entrusted us to use their money wisely. Our priority is then to helping the people first, which we do so by, help, by protecting their savings directly through the deposits insurance scheme. This renders bailing out banks redundant and unnecessary, as they are the wrong target group. In fact, bailouts are in ineffective because banks will not only use Point the bailouts in the moment, madam, to recover their losses from bad investments, but in fact, they'll give, wouldn't, you, wouldn't you agree that they'll give no priority whatsoever to deposits and savings? You do realise that businesses are dependent on banks. If your banks fail, your businesses fail. We need to bear in mind that in Singapore, there are many banks, that we aren't just dependent on a few local banks or a single bank, that there are, first of all, other local banks to turn to, and that even if these banks do fail, that they can turn to other foreign banks. And even in this instance, in my policy earlier, we have laid out that these banks can be sold and that their, their loans can be guaranteed. Hence, the banking, the banking function is still preserved and protected. But more importantly, I would like to put forth to you, and I want you to listen to this opposition, that bailouts are not effective because banks are only concerned about recovering their losses. Banks are only concerned about using bailout money not to lend out, not to give to savings, but to use it to pay for their toxic assets. And hence, this isn't going to be protecting the people. Instead of protecting the people, the banks are obviously going to care the most about themselves first. 
And hence, if it's the people that are having problems, we should help the people directly. And I have an example to show you. This was exactly the case with Merrill Lynch, where Stanley O'Neill used reserves to buffer toxic subprime mortgages instead of safeguarding the client's money. It is such things which we cannot allow to happen. And this money, which is used to help people, is far better spent on them by providing job credit schemes or tax rebates or to stimulate the economy even. We should not and cannot use taxpayers' money and our reserves irresponsibly for the mistakes of banks. The immense cost of bailout then becomes the burden of the Sir. people and no longer the problems of the bank. And it is the people who have done nothing wrong. This tarnishes the sanctity of reserves and diverts money away from helping the people. With all the risks, lowering and preventive measures that are already in place, should banks still fail, it is clearly because they've taken unnecessary and unwise at risks, and it's hence the responsibility of the banks. Or they have a systemic flaw that will still occur and that will still remain, even if you bail them out. The government cannot afford to splurge on bailouts when it has to protect the savings of the people first. Giving money to the banks to pay for their toxic assets isn't going to help the people at all. It only helps the banks. And governments are not beholden to helping the banks. This is an unnecessary cost. Helping our citizens directly instead of endlessly injecting money into banks is more targeted, efficient and responsible use of our limited resources because it is our responsibility as the Ministry of Finance to help the people who have invested their trust in us. We cannot protect banks from failing. Thank you, Lloyd. The speaker spoke for five minutes and eight seconds. I now call upon Kenny Ngo of Innova Junior College to begin the attack from opposition. I now call Cheng Lui Chun of Hua Chong Institution to begin the attack from opposition team. Sorry. Now, as the representatives of local banks, we believe that we are vital to the economy, and this warrants the government building us out. So before I move on to my few main points of contention, let me first clarify a few things. Firstly, in today's debate, we are referring only to banks which are allowed to trade in assets and liabilities denominated in the Singapore dollar. Examples, like the proposition has rightly pointed out, include banks like DBS, OCBC, and other local banks. Secondly, we agree with the proposition today that the government needs to support alternatives to prevent bank failures in the first place. An example could be how the proposition has brought out a government-supported bank merger. And another example could be how the government has already guaranteed full deposits until 31st of December 2010 to prevent bank runs from occurring. Thirdly, we believe today that the government should bail out banks only as a last resort when banks are on the verge of failing and nothing else can save them from their fate. Lastly, we will accept the bill under certain conditions that can be set out by the Singapore government. So allow me now and then to move on to tackle the proposition's case today. Let's, let, me, let me first ask the question, why could banks fail in the first place, specifically in the context of local banks? Now, if you look carefully at DBS, OCBC and UOB, their balance sheets are very beautiful. In fact, you see that non-performing loans only take up, uh, take up to 1% of their total loans given out. This simply means that they have not been engaging or playing around with risky instru financial instruments. What this simply means is so, that as banks, and as Singapore is an open economy, this simply means that these banks, local banks, who are not responsible for what is happening outside, are still susceptible to global fluctuation in the market outside of Singapore. And therefore, we see today that there is no blame to be attributed here. What needs to be done here is to ensure the integrity of Singapore's economy to stabilise the Singapore economy. Moving on to my second point of contention, on where exactly does the government's responsibilities lie? They, tell, they came out here today and told us that the government needs to protect the interests of the people. We agree with them. The government's primary duty of care is to the people. But let's keep in mind today that by building out banks on the verge of failure, you are also helping the people. People have jobs, and jobs are provided by businesses, and businesses rely on liquidity to ensure and to sustain their economic activity. This is something the proposition today has forgotten. In their 
in their desire to protect the people's interests, they've forgotten that yes, you can engage so, on, you can embark on various policies, but ultimately, it's the businesses who give people their rice bowls. Secondly, they came out and told us about how banks are self-centered. They won't bother protecting uh, deposits and of individuals and non-bank customers. But let's keep in mind that when banks receive bailout money, this helps them stay solvent. This makes sure that they are still able to provide loans and liquidity to our economy. And this is what matters, not whether or not the intentions of the banks are pure or moral in this case. Sir. No, thank you, sir. Finally, they came out here and it raised the point about moral hazard, about how it's wrong to help these banks who have played around with fire, played around with wrong financial instruments. Let, let me tell you today that as a local bank, we tell today now is not the time to attribute blame. Who exactly is, for, is, is at fault for today's debacle of the economy of the global financial market? Ultimately, it's about protecting Singapore's interests. It's about ensuring that Singapore, the Singapore's economy does not collapse because banks collapse. Now, before I move on to my substantive, let me then deal with their policy. Now, their policy today, they have three main clauses. We agree with the first two about lowering risk and protecting deposits. But about the last point, about investors buying over. Let's keep in mind today that when all banks are struck, by, uh, because they're all susceptible to the global market, what this simply means is that all of them are suffering. And it's not feasible to expect investors to step in now and to buy banks, because banks nowadays are no longer seen as viable investments for investors. Now, allow me now then to move on to my case division for today. So today, as the first speaker, we're talking to you about the crucial role that banks play in the Singapore economy, which somehow the proposition today has forgotten to mention. My second speaker will be telling you about maintaining the credibility of the business landscape in Singapore. Now, in this time of recession, when aggregate demand has fallen, it is important that businesses have ready access to credit to tide them over the tough times. In November just last year, banks, local banks had up to $160 billion in outstanding loans taken by businesses. This is 66% of Singapore's GDP in 2007, which is testimony to the scale and the amount of liquidity which businesses borrow from banks. In this case, it's not difficult to see why the collapse of banks could limit the availability of credit to businesses. We need to recognise the very real possibility that the collapse of any bank could lead to businesses based in Singapore also going under simply because businesses have no access to liquidity which will ensure that they are able to cover their overhead costs. Ultimately, if the government today refuses to intervene, businesses will fail. Wages will be cut, unemployment rates will soar, and the economy will be expected to contract. The refusal to intervene on the part of the government will only sink Singapore deeper into pits of recession. Thank you. Thank you, Louis Chun. The speaker spoke for 5 minutes and 11 seconds.